Jim Sable, and he's talking about the, the, his Nisqually Pacific Railroad, a, a little bit about the railroad itself, and a lot about the work that he's done to create that, start to create that railroad and the research and different things he's doing to make his railroad a little easier to build and, uh, and work well. So, Jim, are you there? I am. All right, well, when you want me to advance the slide, just let me know. I'll probably say something clever like Greg. Okay, and for everybody <laughs> else, um, if you put questions in the chat bar, Brian Ferris will see those and he can ask Jim those questions when we, when Jim stops or we'll turn everybody else's microphone on after Jim's presentation too and you can ask him directly. So here we go. Thank you, Greg. Uh, even the uh, logo for the Nisqually Pacific Railroad is under development and research. Uh, the one you see here uh, just happens to be the one that is garnering the most votes from uh, friends and family. Uh, incidentally, uh, in, you should want to get a hold of me after this presentation. After my name, uh, Jim Sable is all one word. Just add at msn.com. Jim Sable at msn.com. I'd be happy to answer any further questions that they're uh, too complex for uh, tonight's meeting. Uh, Greg? The uh, origins of the Nisqually Pacific Railroad, in a sense, uh, began in 1846. Uh, what happened that year was that uh, we signed a treaty with Great Britain that the 49th parallel, not the 54th, halfway up British Columbia, that the 49th parallel would in fact be the northernmost boundary of the state of Washington and uh, the United States. When that happened, a uh, kajillion people arriving uh, in Portland at the end of the uh, Oregon Trail, who then typically turn left to go down and settle in the Willamette Valley, uh, began to turn north uh, because it was no longer disputed territory with the British and uh, they knew that they could uh, own property in what became Washington State. And uh, among several places where they, that they settled in addition to Port Townsend and Silicon and uh, Prairies uh, was Squally. Uh, Greg? Um, the uh, pay the uh, ranchers in the Nisqually Valley soon discovered that they could just, uh, I, mean, I should have kept the previous slide, but it's okay, uh, discovered that they could just throw a seed out the window. Uh, and by uh, next spring or next fall, they would have an abundance of cherries, uh, apples, pears, uh, other kinds of berries, uh, barley, uh, oats, uh, all kinds of grains. Uh, potatoes up the yin yang, uh, salmon up the, actually not up the yin yang, up the Nisqually River. Uh, Billy Frank, chief of the Nisqually tribe, who was just this year, had his uh, statue re uh, represent the state of Washington, replace Marcus Whitman's in the Hall of Statuary in, in the United States Capitol. Billy's uh, statue was there. Billy used to say before uh, the whites arrived here, kind of ruined things in the way of fisheries, used to be able to walk across the backs of salmon from one side of the Nisqually River to the other and not get wet. So uh, what the, the settlers did to solve that problem, uh, because they couldn't go east because the, the hill was so steep to market, they couldn't go west to market, reach markets because the hill was so steep there, would they would have spent all their profits in draft horses just trying to get out of the hole. Uh, scratched their head and figured out, hey, we can go right along the shoreline, a uh, piece of cake right up to Stillicum, which was bigger than Olympia in those days, and up to Tacoma to market. Uh, it's water level grade all the way. Uh, the ties are uh, free for the asking just by cutting down the trees. And if they should come to an impenetrable bluff, why uh, just a trestle offshore. And so uh, that's how the uh, Nisqually Pacific Railroad uh, came to be from Nisqually up to Tacoma, Greg. Uh, everything was going uh, just Jake until the Northern Pacific got wind of the fact that the UP was interested in maybe taking over and using the Nisqually Pacific as an access to Tacoma from Portland. Well, that scared the bejeepers out of the uh, headquarters in St. Paul. 
So the uh, I'll make a long story short and say that the Nisqually Pacific became like the SPNS, independently uh, operated, but severally owned by the Northern Pacific, Great Northern, uh, and the Union Pacific with track trackage rights uh, 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 accorded to the Milwaukee. Prosperity uh, brought an extension of the uh, line, uh, one from Nisqually down to the harbor, down to Bruceport and Willapa Bay, and uh, the other line uh, up to Cowlitz uh, River, uh, up to Natchez in a connection with the YVT, uh, the Yakima Valley Transportation in Natchez and thus the Union Pacific and National Markets. Uh, Greg? The uh, poster in the background is from the 1972, 1972 National Model Railroad Convention uh, in Seattle. It's indicative of how long I've been interested in the R&D aspect of layout construction compared to what? Well, uh, compared to my first four model railroads. The first one was tin plate on a four by eight sheet. The other three were serious HO railroads and uh, caused me a lot of problems farther along because I didn't engage in any uh, R&D. One of them was it was just incredibly noisy. Uh, and so were the gears in my locomotives, man to a general and uh, the road bed was noisy and my dad was working swing shift and his bedroom was right below and uh, that was a no-no. So you know, see that block there? That's called a structurally insulated panel. That was one of the first things I researched. Uh, that's about uh, five and a half, six inches of really dense foam uh, clasped by a half inch of the hardest um, OSB you can possibly imagine uh, heat pressed together at the manufacturing plant in uh, Fife. Uh, it's a little bit more expensive than stick framing. In other words, those things come as a panel, eight feet, 10 feet, 16, 24 feet long, whatever it takes to suit you, stand them up on your foundation, put the roof on and you're ready to go. Uh, it's a, a sort of an expensive product, but it goes up in a day. I mean, a 40 by 64 room went up in uh, about uh, 14 elapsed hours uh, one afternoon in the next morning. Um, I have attached it uh, to the home uh, be in a hole in the office in the wall so I can pretend I'm going to work, but I keep right on going to the layout room and I don't have to go outdoors in my slippers or something. Um, the uh, room is also... Uh, as radiant heat in the floors with hot water. And the combination of those two uh, mean that in summer, it's just delightfully cool. And in winter, you could turn the heat off and in maybe three days, it might go down two or three degrees in there. It, it's just so uh, tight that it's uh, really quite wonderful. Greg? So I, I'm gonna interrupt you for just a minute here. Um, on that first slide, everybody, it, Jim showed 21 items that he researched or did something special with for his railroad and we're going to see all 21 of those up in the upper left hand corner of the slide you can see we're on uh, item number two thank you greg you might think you'd start with a track plan well that just leads to trouble no i the next thing you probably ought to r d uh, for your own layout room I'll uh, just throw in an aside here. Greg and I are hoping that you find this clinic uh, instructive. If not instructive, at least entertaining. And if not entertaining, <laughs> uh, you can get a refund at the box office. Yeah. And I'm not nervous either. Uh, even though an hour ago I put some soup on the uh, stove, I forgot to turn the burner on, doesn't mean a thing. And I'll tell you this, after this is over, by God, you know what I'm going to do? I am going to have a chocolate ice cream bar with nuts. I'm not fooling around. Well, anyhow, here's the research I think you ought to do on lighting. Uh, at least uh, it's what I needed to do for myself. Uh, I needed to research uh, LEDs. Uh, I needed to re research bulb type LEDs. They exist or tube type. And uh, start off with lumens. I'll skip down. Lumens is just sheer light power. Uh, uh, can you read the reporting marks on those box cars in the yard during an obsession? Um, can you see your hand in front of your face? 
obviously the more lumens, the better. Uh, we have two model railroaders in the area, uh, Max McGinnis with a doctorate in electrical engineering and uh, Paul Rising, uh, American Institute of Architects, uh, who can calculate uh, the amount of uh, lux or luminescence you need for your room. And I can just about guarantee you, you'll have two responses to their figures. One is, holy cow, <laughs> uh, Home Depot uh, doesn't have enough lighting fixtures in the whole place to produce that uh, much lux. Gee, that's a lot. Uh, but that's what their figures say. And the other response I'm pretty sure you'll have is, I'm not going to do that. God, I'm going to cheat somehow and uh, see how little I can get by with and still be able to read reporting marks. Um, so that's lumens. Uh, back up to life. That's important. I don't want to have to get up, up. Once I hang those suckers up there, I don't want to have to get up again. again. So these particular LEDs that I selected are good for 50,000 hours. I'll take it. Kelvin is really important. Uh, Kelvin is the amount of warmth uh, in a light. Um, I'll explain that by telling you uh, what I did. I was uh, in uh, Jeff Schultz's layout room, uh, right there at the bottom of the stairs. And the first thing you see is a double deck. And uh, Jeff at the time had two different lighting systems for the upper deck and the lower. And with his permission, I took one of his boxcars and I would move it from the top to the bottom, from the bottom to the top and study whether the one with the warm light was more satisfactory than the one with the cool light. Uh, boy, they were both appealing. Both had their advantages. I settled on a fairly uh, cool uh, temperature because I think it more, more clearly uh, represents the color in your cars, your reefers. Uh, and the weathering on your locomotives and so on. Um, CRI is critical. Uh, CRI is the color rendering index. And many of the model railroader has completed their prize winning model or so we thought at his workbench, put it on the layout and it looked ghastly because he changed bulbs. Do you remember back when uh, people uh, under fluorescent lighting would look ghastly green, especially around the edges that uh, women just hated it. Uh, that was color rendering index. Uh, 80 is about as low as you want to get when you're studying bulbs. And before you buy a bulb, uh, you want to uh, get all of this data. And if you go to a lighting store, generally they will have it. Watts is important because you're on a layout the size of the one I'm talking about, uh, Laurel Joiner's layout in San Antonio, uh, Michael Connell's uh, in Maple Valley, or mine, Jim Sable in Tacoma, Washington, uh, above anywhere above 2,000 some square feet, uh, you're going to eat up watts like crazy and you may have to have a, a Puget Power install a substation just for you. That's why a nice low rating like 42 watts, uh, even though you might add uh, 40 of those fixtures, uh, 40 times 40, it's only 1,600 watts for the holder. That's piffle. So uh, those things need to be checked on. Now, in order to fudge on the lumens and not listen to Max McGinnis or Paul Rising, who are trying to have us uh, have a kajillion uh, lumens, we'd like to just hang a couple of test lights from the ceiling, turn the lights out, close the shades, turn those bulbs on, and uh, say, well, how's this? Take that light meter, which is sitting in the middle between the two bulbs, and measure the amount of uh, lumens that you're getting. Uh, now to uh, get the, those as close together as they need to be, but as far as apart as you can afford, so you can get by with as few as possible, you gotta go up to the ceiling, uh, drill a hole, hang the hooks, hang the fixtures, shut out the lights, turn these on, take a reading. Oops, I need to be a little farther apart. Go back up, take the screws out, patch the holes. That could get old in a real hurry. So guess what? I was just sitting there staring at this for a moment one time, and all of a sudden, this little voice in my ears, hey, dumb nuts. That's my uh, guardian angel talking to me. It says, why don't you just lay those upside down on the layout? And in real life, they're going to be 48 inches from uh when they're hanging from the ceiling 
from the fixture to the layout surface, aren't they? Well, just sit these upside down. Get up on the layout 40 inches above with your light meter, measure it, and if you need it to move it one way or the other, well, just scramble down and move it. Now moving it is a piece of cake. You can do that all night long with no holes in the ceiling that have to be patched. So that's why those are sitting there uh, upside down. Of course you can stand on this bench work. <laughs> why not? Greg? Something else that should come next, uh, I think, in the style of R&D is the backdrop. Um, the uh, easiest way to do, rather than going in and setting all those paint chips, take your cell phone and take a picture of the color of the sky as you like it on the type of day that you like, and the paint store will match that, and they'll uh, make you a custom can of paint that matches that exactly. Um, what I'm doing here, I just uh, painted this uh, in a half hour or so, uh, just to get the feel of what the paints are like and whether I could uh, begin to show distance and what color sky I like and all that kind of stuff. So I'm just messing around. Uh, what I'd say on the, uh, the sheet here is a little bit more elegant. Practice. Try it out. See if you like oil or acrylics. Uh, I found that you can get some wonderful effects with oil, but it sure would help if you were a professional. Uh, for me, just kind of a dummy. I'm going to stick with acrylics because they're easier to do. If I don't like it's there, you can paint literally right over it and start again. And you can do it right now. With oils, you'd have to wait 24 hours for it to dry. Uh, do it first means you would be well advised, I think. Now, yeah, I'll take that back. I'm not here to give advice. I'm here just to tell you how I did it in case you find that informative. Uh, I think I ought to do the backdrop first. Otherwise, you've got to climb over your layout, knocking down feed mills, kicking over cabooses, uh, scrambling telephone wires. Uh, do the backdrop first, okay? Greg. The same with the foreground. Uh, this is the only piece of finish, finished scenery I've got in 40 by 64 feet so far. I just wanted to show you uh, what I was doing here, again, in the spirit of trying it out. I went to uh, Ace Hardware, bought some of those short little cans of Rust-Oleum, uh, grabbed a half a dozen colors I thought might be appropriate, and I just started spraying just sh 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 uh, all over the place, uh, and uh, this was the result. Um, the thought of painting foreground scenery with a brush, uh, you'll be there until next year's 4th of July, and I'm not sure you would like it as much. Uh, those little spray cans just went uh, well, that's what I got with the spray can. So uh, just wanted to show you that you can experiment with that. And again, they're acrylics. So if you didn't like what you got, we just spray right over top of it and uh, do, uh, do it again. Greg? Uh, next thing to figure out is the minimum radius you're going to need. You're probably wondering why not. Where the heck is the track plan? Oh, it'll be about another 10 or 12 steps down. In the, the system I'm describing for you of R&D, there are a ton of things that need to be researched before you make that first sketch. Uh, the point is this, uh, if you make a track plan and then go ahead and build that layout and find out that your favorite locomotive won't get around that curve, uh, you're up a creek without a paddle. So uh, these benches have been put together, plus some more at the bottom, to swing those curves all the way around in a total arc. The first one, 72 inches, so that means that's going to be 12 feet across. <laughs> that's all scale for you. Uh, the next one is 66. Uh, the innermost one has a big Z5 Northern Pacific locomotive, and it'll go around 62 just, just barely. Uh, the uh, Great Northern P2 Northern, it does not want to go around a smaller radius than 66. So what I'm saying up here in the text, something has to give. Uh, are you going to change the layout or are you going to change the locomotives you own? Diesels, of course, will go around anything. Well, I've decided I want to keep that Great Northern P2 because it's going to pull a, an Empire Builder into the, my Union Station. Uh, and so the effective minimum radius for my layout has got to be 66 inches. But without R&D, I wouldn't know that. Uh, critical to do that. Greg? Something else that I think uh, needs to be R&D before you start 
is provide for easements. Um, lots of guys just skip that step altogether. And, uh, and um, I hate that idea. Uh, for me, I've just got to have easements on the uh, Nisqually Pacific. For one, they're just gorgeous. I mean, is that a beautiful curve or not? Uh, with uh, super elevation and see the Empire Builder coming around or the Silver Stallion or the North, North Coast Limited come around that corner. Oh my gosh, it's gorgeous. When you have a true easement, you can look down that line and you can't tell where the tangent ends and the curve starts. You really can't, not kidding. Uh, so it's gorgeous, it's prototypical, and you will be amazed at how it eliminates derailments. So how do you provide for that? Greg, on the next slide, uh, if you like to do quadratic equations for fun uh, and enjoyment, um, why you can you know, do the math to figure out how to do it. Uh, a dummy like me, I'll just use a bent stick. Um, the uh, top line is a true curve. I think it's a true 66 inch radius, you know, drawn with a big trammel. Uh, so what I do is off to our right where there's no hand, that end of the stick is being held to the true curve. The bottom end of the stick is let go to its natural springiness about three quarters of an inch over. And you just trace that line that gives you the easement. So how much do you need to add to your curve radii in order to have an easement? Uh, in this case, it's three quarters of an inch on each side, total inch and a half, cheap at half the price. If you can't get that much, here's what I found from R&D. Anything, anything will, will help. If you can only get a quarter inch, total of a half inch, take it. And you will be amazed, it does make a difference. And I'm going to tell you one more thing that you're not going to believe, and I'm not offended because I wouldn't believe it either. And that's this. If you have a locomotive that has difficulty going around a particular radius, it's just a wee bit too tight. If you add easements on both sides, that locomotive will make it. I know you don't believe that. I had to try it myself before I believed it, but I'm telling you it's true, right? Okay. In the next, before we get that track plan, you got to make your own list of things I just got to have. And here's my list. I just got to, got to, got to fit all these in someplace or it just won't look like Tacoma. Nisqually is more nondescript. All I got to do is have some uh, lichen bushes and some water and you got Nisqually. But uh, Tacoma is, is just uh, screamed out its identity uh, with these particular items, Greg. Right? Here's the first one, Tacoma Union Station. Just got to have it. Uh, Union Station was in danger of being torn down. It had become a halfway derelict. The roof was starting to leak. And uh, James Merritt, uh, a Tacoma activist, was instrumental in getting it saved and repurposed as a federal courthouse. And uh, I called him up and said, I want to have a model of Union Station. Can you help me? He let me into his office. He let me take all of the blueprints that I cared to use. Uh, what a guy. Uh, and so uh, with those blueprints, I'll show you what uh, happened later. Uh, next, Greg. Another must have is that whole junction of tracks that comes into the coma uh, from uh, geographic north, uh, having come up uh, from the Squally uh, along uh, Chambers Bay uh, along Day Island, underneath the current Narrows Bridge, uh, around Point Defiance, along Ruston Way, past McCarver Street, and right up the chute here. Uh, this was called UP Junction because there is a uh, track uh, that takes off at the bottom center and goes left across the city waterway. Uh, I've just got to have this whole junction area. That's the NP track making a loop. So my loop is prototypical. There's another track. Okay, see the elevated, uh, uh -huh, that elevated roadway? Uh, go to your left, go to your left, to your left, right there, right? That's the UP track that took off from underneath the fruit warehouse there and crosses the waterway. 
And the whole thing is called UP Junction, even though there's uh, another half a dozen NP connections. Okay, what's next on my must-have list? Oh, got to have the 11th Street Bridge. Nothing screams Tacoma like the 11th Street Bridge. Doesn't It's a little hard to make out, but look at Mount Rainier. There it is right between the towers. Next, please. Got to have the NP Headquarters building. I made some sketches of it and took some dimensions. Mary and I did with a ruler one afternoon. Uh, I wrote to St. Paul and um, uh, got the blueprints. Have I got time to tell another one of my rotten little stories? Just kind it's of you know. Well, I worked and worked and worked with a guy who works in the St. Paul uh, Public Library. And I had to explain to him over the phone what the heck I wanted. He had to go through drawer after drawer file after file trying to find this. Okay, following summer, Mary and I are up on the deck at Paradise in Mount Rainier, right outside the ice cream store, having a nice cone on a sunny day. And there were a couple of guys there, and I'm the chatty type. So I said, hi, how are you enjoying the Northwest? That's the guy. It was the same guy who got me those blueprints. Can you believe that? Okay, got to have this. Next slide, please. And got to have uh, the Sperry uh, Ocean Dock with the Centennial Flour Mill, uh, which went through several names, um, uh, with the uh, ocean-going ships in the foreground. Uh, just, just got to have that. It just screams Tacoma. And time to start drafting the track plan. You thought we'd never get here. Well, now that we know, well, now that we got the lighting, we can see hand in front of our face. Uh, now we know what the, the minimum radius is. Now we know what the easements are, yada, yada. We can start putting together a plan. Uh, there's your standard tools. The curly thing, uh, if you don't have one of those, uh, race down to your uh, stationary store. And it's a curvable ruler. It's... Uh, um, gradated on each side so you can count off the inches and feet and you can twist it to follow any shape. The uh, cardboard template uh, is something I made for myself. It's exactly 66 inch radius. So whenever, you know, I need to flop it around, testing here, testing there, will this fit, will that fit? Uh, you know, I don't have to draw it. I just flop, flop that down. Um, the uh, ruling pin at the bottom is pointing right at uh, two uh, lines on the edge of the uh, document, and that represents the center lines of 16 feet in the prototype. So when I'm drawing the yard tracks, how close to put them together, I just take it right off of there. Uh, at the top of my little template, uh, there's a uh, piece of art gum pointing right at the corner of it. Uh, that is a cutout of the exact dimensions of a number six switch. Uh, if I use that template, which I made sure fits or is accurate, uh, I'll, I'll know that I'm not cheating. Uh, the problem with drawing track plans on napkins in cafes is that you cheat on the radius and you cheat like crazy on the switches. Uh, in uh, O scale, a number eight switch is fully 18 inches long and you cannot shorten it by a centimeter uh, and so on. Okay, next please, Greg. Uh, just to show you how uh, difficult it is to stay prototype. So there's Union Station uh, and the freight yard, which is at what in Tacoma is called Head of the Bay. Uh, the open space in the middle is the city waterway, now called Foss Waterway. And it ends right on the left at Puyallup Avenue, uh, where the rest of the yard and the roundhouse are. So there's Union Station. As we start to flow out to the right, uh, past the freight yard while we get to Tacoma Junction and we're going along the Ruston Way waterfront and we go underneath, we loop underneath Point Defiance. Unfortunately, I ran out of room, even in 64 feet, I had to turn too soon. The model railroaders grief and I haven't got a full Sperry dock where it belongs, but close enough. So we come zooming down the rest of the way. We loop down under Union Station secretively and come out at Chambers Bay which is not too outrageous. Uh, the uh, NP goes through a tunnel under Nisqually. 
and we come out of silicon and off to the right. So uh, that's uh, it's it's uh, good but not great uh, for a model railroad. Uh, I think that most visitors will, who at least know the railroad layout, will recognize uh, basically what it looks like. Greg, here's the whole track plan, and uh, there are two R and D things that I wanted to point out here. You see those little plus marks? Well, they are where the point of my compass was. Is I drew uh, each of those uh, loops. Now, how do you get from track plan to uh, lumber? Well, assuming that the plan is accurate, that you haven't cheated, I'll take that one in the middle that says plumb bob. I'll measure over to the wall, because according to the plan, it should be 12 feet, three inches. This plan is drawn half inch of the foot. Assuming I didn't cheat, and these are really accurate drawings, that really is where the center of that circle. So we'll make an X or a plus mark on the floor, 12 feet, uh, three inches from that wall and an appropriate distance from the other wall. And I get the ladder and I hold the palm bob up to the ceiling, touching the floor. Mary's down on the floor, studying the plumb bob till it's right on that X. As soon as it is, I mark the spot on the ceiling, put in a cup hook, and hang the plumb bob straight down so it would hit that mark, then take the string off to the side wall and tie it off after I pull the plumb bob up in the air so I don't bang my head on it. Now, that plumb bob will stay there till I need it. When I get to that part of the construction, lower the plumb bob to the uh, area and you know exactly where that's centered. Now, why do you have to be so fussy? Well, because even in a building uh, 40 feet wide, there I don't have an inch to spare. You can see that there are some pinch points on here. I'm trying to keep 48 inches or a minimum of 36, but there's a couple of spots where it drops below 36. And I tried to make those not operating pits, but that's the reason for the accuracy. Uh, if you're making a uh, layout as I did in a bedroom or a closet, or a basement, uh, you know, maybe you don't have to worry that much, but uh, here you do. Um, let's see, um, in the upper right-hand corner, can you see where it says uh, three, around those three tracks? Uh, here's something that I discovered the hard way, uh, or fortunately, I found out before I discovered it the hard way by operating on other guys' layouts. If you have uh, an industry, a, a town, a small town, along the route where you're going to stop and switch, a single siding is not enough. You want two sidings. With just one siding and you got an opposing train coming at you, you're stuck. There's no work you can do until that guy arrives, does his work and leaves. Whereas if you have three tracks in your wayside places, uh, the uh, local freight continue to do his work while the uh, through freight is uh, occupying main one. So three track is kind of important there. Okay, so keeping in mind those plus marks and the plumb bobs are now hanging from the ceiling. Greg? You can lower that plumb bob down from the ceiling and hit that exact spot on your layout where, Greg, you need to swing the trammel. Uh, I have three holes drilled in the end. Uh, what have I said there? Uh, 66, 70, and 72 uh, for the track centers. So uh, I'm swinging a 66 inch radius because I remember I discovered earlier that's my minimum. So that's how you go from track plan to plumb bob to trammel to the actual uh, route. And you can rely on the accuracy of it because you we're careful with your measurements. Great. Another uh, element that's uh, sort of important, I mentioned my dad working nights and trying to sleep downstairs while I'm running a noisy layout in my bedroom. Uh, what I've done here is uh, taken about an eight foot section of track, taken the very noisiest brass car I can think of, um, and made a measured distance down the grade uh, ending in a um, 
piece of foam at the end so it won't break uh, the uh, end rails off. And just before it hits the foam, I set the uh, meter in front, a decibel meter, and we take measurements, uh, uh, five at least for each kind of roadbed. Try just plain track on plywood, try it on cork, try it on homosote, try homosote on cork, try cork on homosote, yada, yada, yada. Take notes, take notes, take notes until you find uh, the combination that works best for you. And then standardize on that on the way you're going to uh, build your layout. Um, it's uh, especially, oh, uh, there are some construction methods I've seen in some of the layouts around uh, that are beautiful layouts, but kind of noisy. And uh, in the smaller scales, it sort of defeats the purpose of the sound system. Uh, the sound system is so loud, no scale, we can overpower it. But uh, at anyhow, uh, the the less noisy your roadbed is, the better you're going to like the sound from your locomotives. Great. Okay, now there's the cost of the whole thing. Um, let's see. These were prices about 15 years ago. A two by four in front, dollar ninety five. A standard and better, uh, one by four, two thirty nine. Uh, number two and better, uh, three twenty five. Those prices have all gone up, obviously, since that time, but not as much as the 2x4. That is, the 2x4 uh, is, uh, is right around 8 bucks right now, where those other things are just sky high. So 2x4 uh, is actually the cheapest lumber that you can find. I know a lot of guys will cut their 1x4s out of a sheet of plywood, three-quarter inch sheet of plywood, and make sawdust all over the place. But... Um, for me, this is the easiest, the cheapest. Now, it, depending on what part of the country you're in, yeah, I know that two by fours have a chance, have a, 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 a tendency to warp. Uh, the answer is this. One, um, don't buy any more two by fours than you need this afternoon. Go straight home with them, get them in, screwed in, glued in, tightened in, and you have no problem. And the ones that develop a little bit of a wiggle that you didn't catch, uh, those can be the legs, which are only 20 something inches long. Uh, I forget what my own legs are. So uh, cost and anti-vibration because they're stout, just heck for stout, least amount of sawdust and they're just dimensionally stable like you wouldn't believe. They asked my friend Laurel Joyner. Uh, he framed his layout with two by fours the same way you'd frame around. Why did you use the two by fours? Because he said, Two by sixes were not on sale that day. Okay, Greg. Uh, about that dust. I thought about having the saw in the layout room, putting a shower curtain around it. Big mistake. It was just easier. Uh, I cut a hole in the wall with those SIPs. It's a piece of cake, as long as you put in the header. And it made, made a lean-to shack in the back, uh, where I have the saw and a dust collector. And uh, it's a real luxury to be able to cut your lumber for the layout right there. Uh, on a nice day, I can carry it outside and put it on horses. Uh, but uh, a shack in the back with a saw is a, is a really good idea. Greg. Now, we get ready to make the bench work. Uh, this looks like a work table, and it sort of is, but it sort of isn't. What it is is a jig, a place to set the pieces that will make uh, the benches uh, because uh, like Henry Ford discovered, uh, the, there's nothing like an assembly line to speed up production. So there's a nail gun, there's some glue, and there's a staple gun. Greg, here's a whole stack of 240 two by four legs uh, ready to go. Let's see, that will give me uh, 60 uh, benches, won't it? Because each bench has about eight legs. Okay, there are the two by fours ready to go. There's the jig, Greg. On the surface of the jig, uh, there are those are glued and screwed little keyways, Greg. So into each keyway, well, you can pop a two by four, pop, 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 pop. Uh, and I put a piece of masonite against the wall so I won't put a whole dent in the wall. Uh, the reason that there's a little area in the table in the foreground ahead of the two by four is that's where you put the top plate. 
In other words, the two by four runs all the way across there. And you come along with your nail going pop, 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 pop. And you have basics of a, a leg as soon as you add the stiffener, right? Here's a second jig uh, right in front of the other one. And this is where we'll take the legs as we pull them out of jig number one, pop them in here for final assembly, right? Here's uh, uh, Scott Buckley and uh, Mike Shaw uh, setting a finished leg uh, into the keyways that are on this jig. And the only uh, anti-sway it's needed is that uh, four and a half, five inches of hardboard up at the top on each side that we put in while it, the legs were still in jig one. Uh, strangely enough, that actually has a name. Uh, uh, what was that guy's name? It's a uh, Belgian professor who discovered that this is, in fact, a box girder, which is just as strong as a triangular girder. Greg? So many hands. Let's see who we got here. Uh, from the left is... Uh, that's... Um, oh, that's Scott. Up on the top left is uh, Scott Buckley. Next is uh, Greg Wright. Our host tonight, there's Kirk Rader, Robert Grove down in the front is a friend, Gene McIntosh, uh, yours truly, and uh, Mike Shaw. So many hands make, make light work. Uh, we had two different sessions in a neat session uh, in, oh, I don't know, two hours. Um, it, we, I think we made approximately uh 25 to 30 benches a piece in about two hours i mean that's fast all of those benches for the layout this group was uh from the top there john glass uh, and the buddy of mine don black uh mike shaw again brian brian ferris uh down in the front row tubby me uh dave fawcett uh, uh his father-in-law mark pelia and uh, robert grove all just terrific guys and uh, what, isn't this one of the greatest things about model railroading where a bunch of guys will be able, willing to come over to your house and use your tools to make long pieces of lumber shorter and screw things and cut them and all that kind of stuff uh, for the price of a lunch. Greg? So here's a completed bench work section. Uh, what isn't immediately obvious, it's eight feet long by 24 inches wide here, um, is that uh, there are keyways in the second jig uh, where I can make this two thirds long because it's 32, 66, 96. So you could make this 66 long instead of 96. And the width of it are 24 inch uh, pieces of hardboard, but you could make those 16. In other words, you could make four different sizes from the same jig, depending on which keyways you use. Great. Now here, I've taken black cutouts or scale size of benches, laid them on the track plan, uh, both in the same scale, obviously, to see how many benches I need and where. Uh, the reason they don't butt up against each other is because all of the joists on the bench work will be 16 inch on center. Um, so this is about uh, how many uh, the benches it'll take to do the whole darn layout. Uh, Greg, would you go back one, please? I'm going to talk about this later, but if you follow with your cursor starting on the left of that red level and go to the right, 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 till you get to that far right leg, the last leg, right underneath it, you can just see a little gray, that's homosote. A lot of guys have a plywood deck for their layout, homosote on top. I start right on the basement floor. And you say, what the heck? Oh, I am trying to save, save every decibel I can. You remember that decibel meter I showed you? Well, this saves about, uh, oh, what I forget what my numbers were, something like 1.78 decibels by having that homosote under there. And then if you go up, the two by four joist sticking out at us, hard to see, but each one of those is sitting on another piece of homosote for another 0.175 uh, uh, decibels. And the reason that's significant instead of piffle 
is because the decibel scale is so small. Standing next to a jet engine at full throttle is only 130 decibels. Well, you know, you'd think it'd be 13,000 or something. So the scale is very truncated. So saving two to three to four decibels right off the bat before you even get up to above is significant. Again, Greg, next. So there's the benches. Uh, next is the benches in real life. Here they are in the same place we were on the plan. Um, what about the big space in the middle? Where the two by fours are going to span that, so you don't need joists there. Uh, it's amazing what you can. Uh, that particular one is a waterway, uh, so that space is open. Uh, see the carpet, but off to the left, the joists will go from there all the way to the wall, and so on. Next, please. Here's what it looks like when you start putting the two by four joists on, and uh, here's what I mean when I say. Uh, put those uh, joists on as soon as you get home and you'll have no trouble with warping and because those are just fastened right there. And notice how the benches on the left is one end on to us. Uh, off to the lower right is one at a slight angle and it's also a shorter one. It's only two sections long instead of three panels. Uh, and, and next please. So on top of the joists go the plywood. Uh, what we see there is a cutout for the Tacoma engine terminal. Uh, one of the things that you really have problems with in O scale is um, uh, reach. You know, your arms don't get any longer just because you're in O scale. And we all know that the practical limit is right around 24 inches. Or if you're on your tiptoe, you can maybe make 30, depending on what you're doing. Uh, so uh, we have some cutouts in this layout. Next, please. Uh, just another shot of how you can make free form with this style of bench work. Uh, there's hardly a straight line anywhere on this layout except uh, along the Foss waterway. Uh, I use the spine uh, pieces all the time. I'm going to have spine road by supporting the home, so although I don't have a picture of it here. Here I'm using the spine just to uh, follow the line uh, that's on my track plan. Uh, it's uh, just easier to trace the line with uh, this way, Greg. Okay, now here's where things get really different. You would think that that home assault would just sit right on the plywood and we start laying track. No, uh, remember you cannot get underneath the layout. That's full of shelves uh, with boxes that the locomotives came in, which you dash and throw away supplies, books, all that kind of stuff. But then above the homosote, about eight inches on those uh, two by eights there, uh, I call that uh, a basement of the layout. Uh, electricians would call it a chase. And that's where your wires can go instead of underneath the layout. Uh, we went over at uh, a model railroader layouts one night, uh, helping with construction, a modeler who's, who's, who will be nameless uh, who lives along the main line in Lacey of the BNSF Railroad and frequently favors us with pictures of trains going by on the main line, who shall remain nameless, and uh, who, who, who models the uh, Southern Pacific and the Santa Fe over Cajon Pass, but who shall remain nameless. And uh, we showed up at his night to help uh, do the uh, wiring leads. And he, he hands me and Alan Manson, uh, the team, uh, sheaf of uh, wires, uh, number 12, I think, about eight inches long. And Alan, being no dummy, immediately said, Jim, you get under the layout and I'll hand you the wires from the top. Oh, okay. So he soldered the wires to the rails, poked them down through the hole, and I'm down underneath, supposed to be hooking these up to the bus. It only took me three bottles of liniment and about three days of bed rest after crawling out from underneath that bench work uh, on Jeff's layout, who shall remain nameless. Um, here's how we, I think maybe we could have done it on the uh, Nisqually Pacific. Next slide, please. Here's how it would look if all the fascia is in. The bottom fascia, that's on the ends of those two by fours. Okay, what that gives you next up 
that platform where the cups are gives you a leaning rail. One of the shortcomings on a lot of layouts is there's no place to put your coffee. There's no place to put your elbow if you want to leave. And if you're holding up a little kid to your chest, uh, there's no place to put his feet. So you don't have to take his full weight. Uh, that gives you a leaning rail. And this leaning rail on the Nisqually Pacific follows the layout all the way around. I've seen some layouts where the guys will maybe uh, uh, screw a straight piece of one by four for six or eight feet. But this leaning rail follows the curves, follows the entire layout. Okay, there is behind the upper fascia is that basement I'm talking about. And that's where your wires go. Uh, here's what I could have done. Uh, and I'd like to do on my layout. So, okay, let's say that track is a little closer to the guy standing in the well there. So you solder your feeders to the track. Down they go through a hole you know, in the uh, home soat, and you just bring them forward. And you see where I have the bus wire there along the fascia? Well, that would really go behind the fascia. But if I put it behind the fascia, you couldn't see it. So uh, take a look uh, and think about the tools you need to uh, solder underneath the layout. Well, you need a soldering iron, you need wire cutters, uh, you need a mechanics uh, creeper, uh, you need a couple bottles of liniment, and you need band-aids for the solder that went down your pants and in your eye. Now on the Nisqually Pacific, see here on the left, here's the tools you need to wire. You need a soldering iron, you need wire cutters, you need a comfortable stool. Just sit right out there. You need your TV remote and a beverage. And you can wire all afternoon and never get a crick in your back. So that's the advantage of that little, what I call basement right there. And you're thinking, wait a minute, wait a minute. Here's the heavy plywood down on the joists. Well, that's good, gives you a nice solid foundation. But the homosote up here is only supported by that lattice work of two by eights on end and one by twos. And you say, that's not going to be strong enough. Yes, it is. Uh, one of the things I've are indeed is I have put home soap on uh, joists that were 10 inches apart and I've knelt on them and walked on them. No give. Uh, I wouldn't recommend jumping up and down on them, but home soap is stronger than you think. Okay, next please. I, I'm going to close here or, or wind, begin to wind it up. Well, just a couple of little hints about construction. Uh, I'm going to have several bridges and I've, after R&Ds here and there and visiting other layouts, I'm going to settle on lift bridges. And something you might not think of if you haven't an R&D'd it yourself is the hinge must be above the level of the track. It uh, doesn't matter what dimension, but it's got to be above the track. Or when you go to lift the track, uh, it'll just grind against the other end and in fact will jam. So that's why the little one by twos are supporting the hinge is to get that hinge up in the air. Uh, it doesn't make any difference how tall. It could be an eighth of an inch or it could be eight inches, but you need to get that hinge above the plane, uh, level plane uh, of the rail or you're going to jam. One more little hint. Uh, something guys have on the next please. Something guys have told me is that Microsoft engineering track, uh, flex track is hard to bend without kinking it. Uh, gee, I just cut myself a 66 inch radius chunk of plywood and you, you just lay the straight track on top and then easy, easy, easy from the middle and then from the ends, from the middle. It is in about five minutes, you can have perfect curve. And if it needs to be sharper than that, uh, you can do it just by going out to the end. Or if that's uh, uh, too sharp, you can undo it uh, a little bit at a time. The point is, uh, get yourself a uh, uh, thing like this and you have no problem kinking uh, microengineering track. Next, please. So those are the 21 engineering things on uh, the Squally Pacific. Uh, now I'd like to go back and show you the icons. Uh, there's Union Station, got to have Union Station on the layout. And in the upper right corner there, there is a picture uh, of uh, Tacoma Junction, UP Junction, that whole area that flows in Tacoma that's also an icon. And I have that as a picture, literally that size. 
it's about four feet high and I don't know, nine, 10 feet across. And a lot of guys on their layout down on the front fascia will have pictures of the actual scene they're modeling so that the visitor can compare the, the reel to the model. That's a heck of a good idea. And I thought about putting this picture of the whole darn Tacoma Junction up on the wall right behind, you know, Union Station, which is about there on the picture. Uh, so you could kind of see what the whole area used to look like in the 30s. And Greg very kindly transposed the picture, put it up on the wall there for me. Next. One more shot of Union Station with uh, Mary's uh, Silver Stallion just in from Portland. The Silver Stallion and its cars, the Silver Spur, uh, the Silver Saddle, uh, the Silver Reins, uh, the Silver Bridle. Uh, what's going to make the dining car silverware, but no. Um, <laughs> next, please. Hey, go back one, uh, would you? I want to show you one more thing. What if a uh, disaster day comes in, you got to move? Um, you see those stiffeners, uh, hardboard masonite running left to right. Uh huh. Okay. The little one, Greg, you just had your, uh, the little one right there. Pull two screws at the bottom, two screws at the top, and everything, including the joist, lifts up off the benches. So to move this whole blessed outfit, you'd have to saw the layout apart somewhere on the top, of course, pick your spot. But then everything else, just pull those screws and everything lifts up. Away you go. So it's not exactly portable. In fact, it's not portable at all. But it is under excruciating conditions, you can move it, Greg. So here's uh, where everything uh, comes together down at the junction, which as you can see is under construction, coming from the yard, coming from Union Station. And there's uh, the tower right there is in place. And uh, in the foreground is uh, where the junction switches will go that did not exist in real life, but will give you the flavor, Greg. It would involve two tracks approaching Tacoma from Nisqually, one that comes from Natchez, the big main line, and the other one that comes from the harbor down Willapa Bay, uh, leading into the yard, double crossover, and leading to uh, two double slip switches, uh, both of which are uh, under construction. Um, this uh, will require a tower man to operate this on uh, operating night. And uh, he'll have a control panel uh, that Dr. Max McGinnis, uh, electrical engineer that he is, uh, has designed. It involves, uh, to get through this junction, involves two buttons. You push one button to indicate where you're coming from, where you are right now. You push, while you're holding that down, you push a second button where you want to go, and everything just go ching, 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 lines up for you. Uh, a two button system that uh, Max McGinnis has uh, invented. Okay, keep going, please. Uh, here, just a little bit of a close up. Uh, it's a little hard to see, but uh, all of the rail braces are here. Uh, all of the gauge plates are here. Uh, all of the insulation uh, junctions are here. Uh, there, all of that detail is uh, there on one of the switches. Next, please. Uh, one more icon to have is the Ruston Way waterfront. Unfortunately, that's also where Point Defiance is. I just, even on a 64 foot long layout, I ran out of room. So I'm going to have to fake it. Since you can't see Nelson Bennett Tunnel, which goes under Point Defiance, what the heck? Uh, I'm going to just say, well, this is this very ferry dock here, and the track is in the tunnel until it comes out down at. Um, uh, Chambers Bay. Great. Oh, uh, that uh, ship, incidentally, go back, please, Greg. Thank you. I'm sorry, and thank you for your... Uh, the ship was built by uh, Jim Elder. Uh, Jim is a master shipbuilder. Uh, he has uh, a model with uh, just gorgeous, the SS Tacoma, uh, in the uh, Tacoma uh, Maritime Museum down on Ruston Way. Uh, I saw a ship on Jerry Barnes's layout. Said, "Who built that?" Uh, Jim Elder. 
So, Jim, Jim, I got another ship. And the reason I picked this outline for him to model is because it's only five feet long. But it looks like a real ship. Do you know how long the USS Abraham Lincoln, uh, USS Ronald Reagan would be? 22 feet. <laughs> 22 feet. Where am I going to get 22 feet? Uh, so uh, this looks like a real ship. You know, it looks like a big deal. But it's only five, it's uh, from uh, one of the Lakers. Uh, it's big, but it's uh, little. Uh, back when uh, I was showing the pictures of the guys who helped me, I forgot to mention the names of uh, Tony Hibbler and uh, Joe Stickney, who also really helped a lot. Tony with some of the plastering on my uh, corner uh, to try to make it blend in, and uh, Joe with cutting the big sheets of the plywood. Um, you can you can carry these uh, big sheets of seven coarse, three quarter inch plywood easy enough. Uh, well, they're not real light, but you can carry. But when it comes to cutting them, it sure helps to have another guy on the other end of the horse. And Joe Stickney just helped a ton with that, Greg. And so uh, here are just a few shots around the layout. Uh, that's where the uh, roundhouse will go uh, in Tacoma Yard. And uh, there is just a little bit of a mock-up. Uh, those index cards uh, in... Um, the uh, freight yard. Uh, the first, uh, the first one is the thoroughfare track, uh, the track in uh, every engine yard that you used to get around with, that accesses all the other tracks, the the turntable, the coaling dock, and all that stuff. Uh, the first two tracks there will be arrival tracks, so uh, trains from wherever arrive, uh, the locomotives cut off, and so on, and the switcher goes to work. Now the card waybills. Jim uh, Yonkins, uh, I don't know if he pioneered it, but he certainly was among the first to have a photograph of the card on top of his waybills. And boy, you know, those of you who operated on Jim's Mud Bay know how helpful that is. Uh, I'm going to also have a color code. A uh, train that comes in, uh, the uh, trains can only come from five different places. Uh, Nisqually, uh, Natchez, uh, Auburn, yada, yada. And there will be a color code from where it's going to go. So as it pulls into the yard, uh, the yard master grabs himself the waybills for that train. And he knows how to classify those cards in on the classification tracks, uh, which are those with the, uh, the, the uh, individual cards. Uh, so a combination of the color coding and the uh, photo of the car, I think it's going to help a whole lot. Greg? Thank you, folks. Happy um, uh, Juneteenth Day and Happy Father's Day. And uh, how did I do on time? Five minutes after eight? Uh, I took a whole hour. Yikes. It was only supposed to be 40 minutes. Yeah. Ay, 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 ay. So this would be a good time for any questions. You'll have to unmute yourself to, so that we can hear you. Uh, am I unmuted? Yep, you're good. Okay, good. Well, Brian, did, it, did anything show up in the chat, Brian? Um, not really. There was just a comment that some of the folks that were in those photographs looked a lot younger. <laughs> <laughs> happened to be right now. So um, I noticed I had a little more gray now than when I was in that photograph. And so anyway... Well, for, um, for, oh, well over 30 years, my schedule looked like this. Monday was Michael Teo. Uh, Tuesday was Enumclaw. Wednesday was uh, Deming out of Bellingham. Uh, Thursday was Office. Uh, Friday uh, was um, Yakima. Uh, alternate, then it alternated weeks. The following week, Monday, was Aberdeen, Tuesday, and so on, and so on, and so on. That went on for about 10 years or so. Then it switched. Then it became Monday is St. Louis. Tuesday is Palatine, Illinois. Uh, Wednesday is uh, Billings. Thursday is Office Day. Friday is and Saturday are Las Vegas. And that alternated with the other week. Monday, that went on for 30-some years. Uh, so that was a little hard to find time to work on the layout. Then when, just as I decided that was, uh, I'd had enough of that, 
uh, Mary became ill with dementia and I couldn't leave her for a minute. Uh, I installed the TV in the layout room and I thought, well, maybe she can watch uh, Roy Rogers movies and uh, I can work on the layout. Uh, it didn't work. Uh, I mean, she just required constant attention and there's just no two ways about it. So yeah, I'm taking forever. Uh, and uh, the typical response would be, well, my God, you're never going to finish this. So, I mean, say something important. <laughs> so what? I'm going to die with my soldering iron in one hand and a big smile on my face. Better than being shot by a jealous husband, which was my first plan. <laughs> out there. So I'm going to try one more little bit of screen sharing here to see if we can't watch a quick video. I love Jim's positive attitude. He's just always complimentary, always full of ideas, always a positive guy. Wow. Is that you, Steve? It is. Thank you, sir. Yeah. My gosh. You'll live to be 150 with that attitude. <laughs> well, thank you, Steve. We got the gray screen, uh, Greg. Uh, okay. Hang on. Let me keep, I keep talking. Oh. oh, can I sneak in another comment? Yeah. Okay. Back when I was showing you the price of one by fours and two by fours, uh, there was a piece of N scale track uh, in the background. And when Greg Wright, who took all these pictures and put all this together, he said, well, do you want that N scale? I said, hey, my motto is I respect all scales. And yes, I have some N scale that I use for a couple of clinics. I use some N scale models to illustrate the point. Uh, respect all scale. What I have found is that two minutes after I'm operating on somebody's layout, scale is irrelevant. I, I don't even know what scale it is. I don't, I had forgotten what scale it is. I'm so busy with the operating scheme. Yeah, uh, scale is uh, your own choice. And uh, the right scale is the one that is good for you. All right. I got the video to work. So Jim, we'll let you show, the, I'm going to show the video and then you can talk about dead rail. Okay. That is a, a G8080 that the Northern Pacific sold at the Port of Tacoma in 1938. And as long as I'm making fiction, I can make that up too. That, folks, is dead rail. No wires. You could put it on the carpet and do the same thing. But I'm still going to use the basement, as I call it, uh, for signal wiring. You know, you, there's a lot more wiring on a layout than uh, uh, just a propulsion. You've got signals, you've got gate crossings, uh, lighting, all that kind of stuff but nothing underneath the layout. Stay out of there. <laughs> <laughs> Not like I'm opinionated or anything. <laughs> okay, anything else for Jim? If not, we'll switch over to our shoot and share. I've got a couple things to show you and a, another person to comment on their layout. Last chance for Jim. All right, here we go. Greg, thanks a million for putting this together, taking all these pictures, doing all the graphics, the lettering. Wow. There'd be no uh, clinic without you. Thank you, sir. Not a problem. All right. So, then thank you. It's a great clinic. Uh, lots of ideas. Um, 
if we all just got one idea out of each of us got one idea out of there, that would be great. So thank you for doing that with us uh, and uh, putting up with the editing and getting us all the way it should be. So this is the shoot and share section of the Olympia Clinic. Um, when you send me pictures, I put them in a PowerPoint and you get to talk about them. That saves everybody some work. Um, it's easy to show it this way. But if you want to do a whole clinic, I'm glad to help you do that too. So first announcements, this is the last Olympia Clinic until the fall. Uh, we're hoping to have face-to-face. -face. They're looking for a, con a location and we would could also consider a different, different night if that would be better. But right now we've got a, a good lead on a location and Don Melnick, if you wanna open up your mic and talk, that would be great. So, yeah, I live in Panorama City. And uh, so I've inquired about to management and it sounds as if uh, so long as there's one or two of us who are residents that the whole group can, can come here and use the large auditorium seats of about 100 in the basement of the Quinault apartment. And uh, I'll know once Panorama really opens up, that's when they'll start taking official reservations. But I've uh, explored. The only, the only con complication will be we cannot have any food in the auditorium because that's not allowed. Uh, and I've also discussed with Greg and we're gonna basically invite any resident who wants to come I have a feeling there's a number of closet model railroaders at Panorama who, who may have some interest, so we'll see. But any of them that want to come will be welcome to sit, and there'll be plenty of seating. And uh, that's all I know right now. I'm glad to answer any more questions, but that's where things are at right now. So really appreciate Don working on that. Um, we don't believe we're going to have access to the county courthouse, um, whether or not they open back up after the pandemic, there's also talk about moving that location and doing some rehab of the building. So it wouldn't be available for that. And our inside our inside person is about to retire. Brian, you wanna give us a quick update on your retirement? I'm gonna retire. <laughs> <laughs> He's gonna retire here in a few days and join, join the Let's Build model railroads in the day group so at age I, heard, I heard i heard it was the every day is saturday club that that worked. i had testified to that <laughs> brian's gonna retire at age 40 no that oh, was the picture of brian yeah wow <laughs> all right so scott Stoll from puyallup uh, hopefully your microphone is open and you can give us a description of the next four pictures, starting with your track plan. All right. Can you hear me? Yep. Okay. So I'm actually going to be giving my layout tour or my uh, work in progress uh, for the 4D uh, next uh, in July, uh, Saturday. So when uh, Greg brought this up last month that they're looking for some pictures uh, of work in progress layouts. I said, yeah, I'd like to do that, but I can't give you the whole thing right now. So it's kind of a little teaser, I suppose. Um, so my layout is in, a, is in a back bedroom of my apartment. And it uh, originally started as uh, kind of as a tribute to my, my dad, because we always did model railroading when I was younger. And I was going to do a little five by five in the corner of, uh, of my bedroom in the back room. Well, eventually, you guys that I railroad with up here in Puyallup, we uh, we took over the whole bedroom instead. And uh, and I and and as uh, Jim had mentioned, even with the big long layout, uh, you still run out of space. So, what I have come up with here is uh, it's a fourteen by nine bedroom, and I went through a lot of uh, plans and ideas of how I wanted to do it. Was it going to be an around the room? Was it going to be a double deck? Was I going to put a helix in the closet? Uh, I really didn't want to get too complicated with it. So, so what, what I came up with is an around the room with a, uh, with a split peninsula. And it does seem to, uh, to connect all the dots that I wanted to have. And some of those were, uh, it, everything on the layout had to be reachable. So, you know, no more than a, a 24 inch wide. And in some cases, it's only 18. 
uh, inches to, to reach everything. And as uh, people in my family said, well, it has to run. <laughs> so I did accomplish those, those things with the help of, of, of my, my guys up here. So it's called the Hazel Redbird Branch Line. And Hazel is the name of a town that my, uh, uh, my relatives in South Dakota uh, live in, in, in farm country. So the area of Hazel and Williamsville uh, is going to be a Midwestern theme. So uh, very low horizon lines with cornfields in the background. And uh, Redbird Canyon and the Troutdale area is based pretty much on uh, northern Idaho and uh, western Montana, um, just areas that I used to, to go through when we drive back uh, to the Midwest. And the Milwaukee Road is in honor of my grandfather who worked for the Milwaukee Road his entire career. So that's kind of a little synopsis of, of what I've came up with. When I, when I did the layout, I, I didn't want to have uh, a whole lot of elevation gain, but I did want the far end of the layout to be the highest point. And how to get there was each section uh, is basically one inch higher than the previous section. So everywhere there's a curve is, is basically where the grade is. And being spaced challenged to get all that in there, I had to go with 18 inch radius curves. Um, we attempted to play with easements and then it just cut out way too much of the, uh, uh, of the aisle way. And, it's a tough squeeze as it is, but I tried to make it so at least the passing passing aisles are about 36 inches. It's just a couple of tight spots where they're about uh, you know, 24. So uh, you can go ahead and go to the next slide there, Greg. So this is the 14 by nine layout, point to point. Uh, and what I've done is in my closet, I've installed a little uh, seven track, uh, three foot sections of flex track for a fiddle yard. And that'll represent all my off, uh, off location points, either going to the east, uh, other Midwestern cities, or uh, off to the west as well too. Um, Milwaukee Road is my road. Uh, the 1970s is, is the area that I, I traveled and traversed that part of the United States. And I just love, I love fall. I love the autumn. I love the, the change of the colors and, and uh, the far uh, corn harvest and so on and so forth. So that's going to be my era. And I began planning this in January of, of 2018, or actually 20, 2019, I think, and uh, took about a year to, to go through all my, all my uh, figures and, and all. And eventually I, I bought the CAD program called AnyRail. And that was a game changer for me because for me trying to draw things, um, they look great on paper. Um, but if you actually put them together with some track, uh, boy, you know, trailing points would take me off the track and radiuses were all wrong. It was horrible. So uh, the computer was, was, was wonderful for me. And then in, uh, in July of, of 19, 2019, um, uh, a crew of, uh, of Mike Shaw, who you've, who you've seen tonight in the previous presentation, uh, Steve Shores and, and Greg Price and I all got to start work on the bench work on my layout. And... So, like I said, in my presentation in July, I'm going to be going through the, the whole pictorial of, of, of all of that. But um, for right now, I'll just show you where the layout was at. This is probably taken about probably two or three months ago. And uh, so this is, is the split peninsula uh, to the right. You're looking at Troutdale. And that's where you obviously see the door when you come into the layout. So I had to make some adjustments to the curvature there which led me to changing my, hey, my... Jim Sable. Could you ask uh, Christine, please, if she's coming tomorrow? Whoa, Jim, you're interfering. Oh, I'm sorry. That's great. Question. That's just fine. <laughs> so, yeah, so Troutdale has the, uh, you know, has the doorway in. And so I had to decide on how I could get my, my tracks to, to do what I wanted them to do. And so I ended up using a, uh, an Atlas uh, snap switch uh, to, as my, my uh, switch to get me up into the yard area and up to the mine so that I could get the correct angle so that I could not have to worry about the door getting in the way. Um, that was a challenge that I had to overcome uh, in uh, another spot as well, too. Um, the other side is um, my area of Redbird, which is going to be a logging area. So that's changed a little bit since this picture is taken. And then in the far back up on the top, that is my, my ore mining 
Uh, yes, thank you. That's my ore mining. And the nice thing about the ore mining, the, the thing I've had to really try to do on this layout is because it's so small, I've kind of had to play with different sizes of, of certain objects. And in this case, the nice thing about using the ore cars up there is they're very tiny. They're only 24 foot ore cars. So they look small and they're off in the distance and that's great because it really contrasts with the rest of the layout because I have the 50 foot grain cars uh, as well too, um, but those are up close. So uh, you can go ahead and go to the next slide there. So this is kind of my, my drone view uh, of the other part of the layout. And that's um, primarily in the far back is going to be the Williamsville yard uh, named for my dad. And that's gonna have uh, some staging and classification and it will have a couple of industries to switch in there as well. You can kind of see on the, the back wall, I've just put up a piece of paper right now or a, of a photo that I took when I was back in South Dakota in Minnesota. And it's actually one shot on a wide angle lens and uh, it, it can still take up a, quite, a, quite a long section of, a, of the, the wall back there. And I do have other pictures I need to sew together as well too, but that's just to kind of show uh, the kind of horizon line that I'm looking for. And then the photo on the bottom there uh, shows the side against the longest part of my wall, which is gonna have the grain elevator and uh, in a cornfield uh, as well too. So then on my far left, back up on that top photo, um, I have uh, a leg that comes out and that can be uh, taken out uh, when, when I need to get into the closet or anything. But what you can't see, because I couldn't get into the picture, is at the end of the leg, there's a, still about a foot or two feet that's open. And when the closet is open, then you can reach the fiddle yard uh, in there as well too. And the fiddle yard is at the same height as the uh, the track there so and of course with having uh not being able to to use anything bigger than an 18 inch radius you can see i'm going to have it run through a tunnel uh there at the end of troutdale and into to redbird just so you're not seeing the full curve uh, of an 18 inch radius to try to minimize that effect of having the tight curves um, on that the system that I run on is going to be an NC, is NCE. Uh, it is all installed. Uh, it's one big power district, so uh, but I don't have any problems with any of the switches except for the curve switch up there by the uh, the grain elevator. So that one can cause some problems if it's not flipped uh, at that point. But everything else runs runs fairly smooth, and we have had one operating session just to kind of give it a give it a try. And uh, so it's, um, it'll, my sessions will probably end up being uh, like an AM and a PM type of a session um, because obviously it's not, a, it's not a real big layout and it doesn't take all that long to get from point A to point B. Um, so anyway, we'll see how that works. Um, I do have JMRI to play with as well too to see if that can help me with some ideas at, at all. But uh, I'm, I'm at that point now where it's, it's Time to start working on some scenery. Um, I've got a few things to, to do with the background yet, but uh, there are some scenery options that I can work on as well too. So anyway, that's my abbreviated uh, layout tour of where I'm at right now. Um, and if there's any questions, I will try to answer those. So Scott, you're, you're doing your, your presentation for the NMRA, our, our second Saturday in July, I think they are. Correct, and yes, yeah, July, July, July 10th. July 10th. Yeah, can you hear me? Yes, I can hear you. Okay, hey, uh, with the tight radius that you're sort of forced into um, with keeping aisle space, what kind of motive power are you using? Are they getting around those corners okay? Oh yes, yeah, yeah, they're all, they're all the proto 2000s, uh, just four axles, so yeah. Oh, oh, are they all diesels? Yeah, they're all diesel. Oh, okay, yeah. I didn't get that. No, I'm sorry. Yeah, I, I do have two steamers um, that, but they won't be used for operations for the most part. If anything, I'll use them for an excursion, uh, just for the fun of it, uh, to run them up there with maybe a couple yeah. of passenger cars, small passenger cars on them. How about a little bit of electric on the Idaho end? Uh, you know, I have thought about that. I that's. <laughs> <laughs> That's a good possibility, but that wasn't the original intent. But yeah. yeah. Uh, Scott, how are you uh, con um, controlling your turnouts? 
Turnouts are all just uh, manual throws. I've got the little uh, the music wire. Um, okay. You can do that, so they're all flicks. Uh, my two curve switches, though, for some reason, we could not get them to hold tight against the rail, so I do have Caboose Industry uh, ground throws on my two curve, curve turnouts. Good. Thanks. And I, and I totally agree with, with Jim. I loved his presentation there about the lighting. Um, I'm kind of a nut for, for lighting as well, too. Um, my lights were given to me for free, so I'm never going to turn down free. And so I have, 10, I have 10 light fixtures with fluorescent lamps up there. And I replaced all the bulbs with uh, 3,500 Kelvin. So a little warmer uh, for my situation. But, uh, but yeah, we've had to move them around a little bit and, and able to get the right lights. But it is quite bright in there. And uh, if I could go LED, I would have. But like I said, I got these for free, so I am not going to complain. Well, a slightly warmer hue for the Midwest. Correct. And it is, it's a master stroke, I think. Yep. Those are warm tones. Yeah, I've, I've always liked the warm tone. Yep. Yeah, yeah. So, and if I could go with 2800, you know, tungsten lighting, I probably would, but it'd be hotter than heck in there. <laughs> okay. Thanks. Where do you live, Scott? Uh, uh, I'm in downtown Puyallup. Oh. Okay. Scott, do you have your rolling, your uh, ore cars already? Uh, I do. I do. I've got two sets of ore cars, actually. I have some of the old roundhouse ones, and then I found some really nice Milwaukee ore cars last year. Um, and I also learned a bit of a history lesson because they're a little different than my original roundhouse cars. My roundhouse cars are what they call a Michigan style war car. So they're a little uh, narrower and they're a little taller. And the Milwaukee ones that I have from Walther's are Minnesota war cars, which are a little uh, wider and not as tall due to the ore docks in Michigan and, and Minnesota are different. Well, the taconite was uh, also lighter, not as uh, massive as the raw ore was. Correct. So they, they put some boards up to yep. carry a little more. So, so my fict my fictional ore cars are will go to uh, Duluth, Minnesota, or to Escanaba, Michigan, uh, is the way I'll have that you know set up. Uh, I also will have a coal train that's just a through train goes from one end of the layout to the other. It doesn't do anything on the layout, but I always liked watching the BN or cars go through North Dakota when we travel up there. So, uh, and I did, I did a little research and saw that the Milwaukee would pull uh, black BN or cars. Uh, so I'm okay with that. <laughs> it looks like you did a nice job of uh, fading the deep blue of sky up high down into the far distant white. That really makes it seem like it's a long ways away. Yeah. That was smart. Yeah, yeah. nice. Yeah. Yeah, I'm trying to make it look as spacious as I can, uh, at least on the, uh, the prairie lands. Um, the other side's going to be, the town of Troutdale is going to look a lot like Wallace, Idaho. Uh, so if you've ever traveled through Wallace, yeah. before they put I-90 over the top of it, yeah, um, I've always thought Wallace is like one of the coolest towns I've ever been through. Uh, they had to roll up the awning when yes. the NP local came through? <laughs> Yeah, no, I liked how it's it's just built right into the hillside, and mm -hmm. that's perfect because I don't have a lot of space. So my town. How many guys that do you see uh, manning in uh, an op session, Scott? So it's it's a, a one to three man operation. Um, it, it's it's great for me to come home and unwind with sometime for an hour just to just to play with. Um, but to have two people operating and having me as maybe a guy to, uh, to run a, a through freight through the whole operation is about it can take. You couldn't get, we can have four people in there when we're working on it, but to actually do an op session, four people would be really tight and you'd really be stuck. I tried to set it up so that the pinch points um, wouldn't have operators working in them at the same yeah. time. So most of the operations would be over across in Williamsville, which is in the top picture, and then Troutdale, which is in the lower picture, and then Hazel and Redbird would be switched only between Troutdale or Williamsville. There would be no switching between Hazel and Redbird, so you wouldn't have anybody messing around back there with those two towns at the same time. What is the height uh, of that uh, bench work we're looking at uh, right there at the end of the room? So at the end of the room with the uh, um, 
with the grain elevator, that's 49 inches. Okay. And then every section that goes around, because it's all built in section, because, you know, eventually it'll have yeah. to move. <laughs> so that's 49. The next one against the wall there is 50. And then uh, 51, 52. And then the mine is actually at 53. So now you're section... making me think I should go up higher. <laughs> <laughs> so... And, and there's all, and when you, somebody mentioned about switches a while back, uh, I do have one tortoise on the layout and that is right up by the mine. And that is only because even though you can still reach the mine tracks, not showing in this pickle, well, you can show it. Yeah, go back to the, yeah, there's the mine. Go back to the uh, first, okay, there, right there. So, oh, there you go. Yeah, so you can still reach the mine from up there if you need to work on anything. But as far as an operating session, you'll be over by the door. And in order to do that, I've installed a tortoise and a switch. Uh, so you just operate the switch from down there. And I'll have um, uncoupling plates up by the mine. It really looks like fun to operate. I can't wait to be one of the three. <laughs> <laughs> well, I'm, I'll be ready for you. All right, well, Scott, thank you for that. And we look forward to seeing your full presentation. Uh, finish up here, I got a couple pictures um, from Harry Avis. He took this locomotive, which is the Bachman HON, or ON30460, uh, based off the Tweetsie Valley uh, locomotive. And he got one undecorated in black instead of the green color. And he's turning that into uh, Southern Pacific narrow gauge number 18. Oh, wow. Building a new boiler and a new cab. And let's see what else we got to notice here. So he shortened the smoke box and the firebox and repositioned the domes. Uh, the frame was shortened, the back end was scratch built. Um, what's really interesting is the cab is sheet aluminum. And then he used this bright silver primer from Tamaya. Looks like it, a cast metal white metal uh, boiler there, but that's all plastic that he's, he's kit bashed down. And then once he's done with the work, then he can get to busy on the paint job. So he shared that with us. And that is the end. Mm -hmm. See you in September. Thank you, Greg.